So today I've got an old piece of electronics to look at. Uh, this is a Rel uh, Lorraine by Railtech um, 48 volt uh, power system or power supply. These, well, this particular one was used to uh, power a fiber optic multiplexer, fiber optic terminal, I guess, technically, at a customer location. Uh, typically, telecom gear is powered by a 48 volt power supply, DC power supply. In a central office or a remote office or something, there would be a large 24 volt or 48 volt uh, charging system and a stack of batteries. So when hydro dies, the batteries just keep chugging along. This thing is basically a miniature version of that. This is the charging part of it anyway. Um, there's a battery box that would normally hang off the back on that connector. I don't have that, the one that goes with this. This thing, like I said, was installed in in a in a, one of my work locations. The the company that installed it uh, years and years ago has, as so many companies have been, you know, bought and merged and doesn't exist anymore. And and the subsequent company doesn't even remember that this thing ever existed and the service was cancelled you know, 15 years ago. And anyway, so this thing, this one was abandoned in place and it was thrown onto the scrap pile recently because there was renovations going on. They didn't want it back. Their name's not even on it. So I feel perfectly justified to store it here until further notice. Yeah, so it's it's nominally a 48 volt power system. The part number, as you can see, says MZ5A50. Uh, I'm going to guess that that's uh, 5 amp and 50 volt nominal. Realistically, to charge a 48 volt lead acid or gel battery typically they're valve regulated lead acid batteries you need about 2.2 volts per cell which works out to about 54 volts plus or minus a little bit so that's what i'm expecting to see on this thing I mean, 48 volts is the nominal when the batteries are not on charge that's approximately what they sag down to until they die uh, so this thing, uh, as you saw on the on the front, it says made in Canada. What else is on the front here? There is a voltage adjust and an LED labeled RFA. That means rectifier fail alarm. So if something goes wrong inside this thing, that'll go off. Okay, so there's everything. Input 124 volt, 120 volts, 4.7 amps. Output 54 volts DC. Remember, I mentioned that earlier. 5 amps. So there's the model number, 50 volt, 5 amp. Uh, Railtech Canada, St. Thomas, Ontario. Now then, they don't exist anymore, as tends to happen. So Railtech Canada started in 80, 1986. They, their name changed to Marconi, uh, Marconi Communications in 1999. And I can't find whether that was a buyout or a merger, or they just decided it was a good idea. I don't know. Anyway, if you follow the the trail, I guess the paper trail through the various companies and whatnot, currently the brand, the Lorraine brand, and the subsequent or the successor to this thing is owned by Ericsson, I think, uh, who owns all kinds of stuff. So, uh, oh, we've looked at the front, we've looked at the back. Let's. So on here we've got some LEDs and some test points. We've got AC on, RFA, rectifier fail alarm, which matches the one on the front. Fuse alarm, low voltage alarm, low voltage disconnect, and an inhibit. AC on, obvious. Rectifier fail alarm, basically if there's anything that fails in here, the relay drops out and creates that alarm. Fuse alarm. The fuses in this thing are a telecom standard fuse that we'll look at in a minute, but they actually have three contacts, and one of those is an alarm contact. LVA, low voltage alarm. Yeah, it's uh, probably a comparator that's checking against uh, reference. And if the output voltage is lower than it's supposed to be, that alarm happens. Low voltage disconnect. That one is something that's designed to protect the batteries from over discharge. It's monitoring. So if the AC is lost, 
this thing's still powered from the DC side, obviously, plus the equipment that it's loaded there that it's supposed to be powering. If the voltage gets too low, low enough that it will damage the batteries, this thing disconnects the loads from the batteries um, to protect the batteries because obviously you've had a power outage for a long period of time at that point. And inhibit, there's a switch inside to inhibit the low voltage disconnect. In case you don't want to protect your batteries, maybe this thing's got a life, uh, life safety system hanging off it or something. Maybe a 911 phone, whatever, uh, that you that it's more important for the service to go as long as possible than it is to protect your batteries. Let's power this thing and see what happens. There we go. Okay. You can't see it. Maybe you can. I don't know. Can you see that? There you go. And the rest of them aren't. So, we should have power then, shouldn't we? Let's check the test points. So, ground. Oh, yeah. Here's something. Uh, notice over here, ground is marked positive and the voltage is marked minus 48. That again is another telecom weirdness standard. Most people are going to be used to uh, ground being negative and the positive voltage being the uh, the actual voltage. Anyway, so there we go, 55 volts as expected. But if I go off the ground and 48 volts, there's neg, you know, 55. But you know, I'm just going to keep calling this 48 volts because that's nominally what it is. That's what it's called. And then the battery voltage, of course, since we don't have a well, okay, the battery voltage is also 55 volts. I assume there's a small resistor between the battery output and, well, when I say small, small ohmic value, big wattage probably, um, just so that you can get a bit of a separation in there. I'm not sure. But typically you can read the voltage, the two voltages as being different. So let's power them off, pop the lid and see all the goodness inside. Wow, pretty much no fancy silicon in there. It's, this is just all power. I count three, four, f maybe five chips in there. Uh, quick glance, there's something to poke with. Uh, a couple of optocouplers probably, or opto isolators. Um, eight pin chip, 16 pin chip, 16 pin chip, and that's it. Everything else is either transistors or diodes. Wow. Okay, so um, this board down here is the actual rectification. Um, let me just pry these little clips out. And so the actual rectifier just slides right out. So this is all the voltage conversion and the high current stuff. This back here, this board is going to be alarming and controls and stuff like that I'm guessing and this board out here is the distribution where should we start let's start back here at the connections and the distribution piece so uh, how can you see this there we go so on the door it's got the labels the fuses labeled F1 to F6 that's these guys we'll take a look at those in a second and then six circuits uh, minus 40 volt return and minus 40 will load on the bottom here. And I think I'm going to just, dis just pull those off just to get them out of our way. Okay, that's a little bit cleaner. So now we can see the other positions on this screw terminal. Uh, they might be a little bit awkward for you to read there. You maybe you can. So uh, the seventh position is fuse alarm, the rectifier fail alarm, low voltage alarm, and AC fail alarm. So the AC fail alarm, because you still have batteries powering it from over here, so when the AC fails, so the control board will still be able to set an AC fail alarm. Um, normally, those are all the standard alarms that you find on pretty much every telecom power plant. Um, so those will be reported back through some telemetry system or other. So the blue and white wire 
are on AC fail and low voltage alarm. So that's the two that they had wired out. So, and then the, the common. So those, the, uh, the alarms are going to be a contact closure between there and there. Uh, and they've got these ones, all, or the returns of them, all commoned and down to the chassis ground down here. So whatever monitoring device that they had these alarms connected to uh, was able to work just off a, a closure to ground and it didn't need the extra wire. So that's interesting. I'll pull that out. Uh, normally, alarms and telecom equipment are just a relay contact closure or something similar. Um, and like in the burglar alarm industry, actually, uh, a normally closed contact, uh, so a short to ground in this case, or closed contact is going to indicate a normal situation. When it goes into alarm, it opens the circuit and that is that signals an, an alarm condition or an error condition. The reason for that is that the wire, if the wiring between here and whatever's monitoring the alarm breaks uh, in this configuration, that's also going to show as an alarm and a technician is going to be dispatched to come and see what the hell's going on. If they were set up as a normally open and alarm on closed circuit, then if the wire breaks or somebody cuts it or whatever, nobody's ever going to see an alarm. Clever, something you don't think about until you have to. Um, let's look at these fuses. So these are a standard type of telecom fuse. They're called a GMT type fuse. This particular one's two amps. As I mentioned briefly before, there's actually three contacts on these fuse holders. There's this one, which is the load side. There's this one, which is the supply side. And then there's another one hovering just up here, which the fuse doesn't normally contact. But if you overcurrent it, it pops that wire, which is the fusible element. And this contact springs up and makes a connection with this contact up here. And that signals the, uh, the brains of the operation, this, the uh, control board down here, that there is an alarm condition and that sends out a fuse, uh, a fuse alarm uh, on here. Now you're thinking, well, I would know that there's a fuse blown because the thing stops working. Aha, but most telecom gear uses dual power feeds. So there will be two power systems side by side each feeding this uh, uh, power into the device. So if one fuse blows or one rectifier fails, you've still got power to the thing for redundancy, right? Um, you want uptime, that's important. But uh, then you know what's gone wrong. You know where to look because there's a fuse alarm and this thing will have the fuse alarm lit there. So you walk into the room and you can see it. Uh, what else is going on? This is that... Uh, uh, disconnect, uh, what was it? Uh, low voltage disconnect inhibit switch. Uh, if I had this thing powered on, which I'm not going to right now with that card out, the, uh, flipping that would light up that inhibit. Okay. What else is there to see on here? There's a few dip switches down in there to, I'm guessing, configure the alarms. There's some transistors and some opto isolators down in there, which again, is probably the alarm outputs. Uh, let me count them. There's four of them and there's four alarm outputs. So that makes total sense. There's a 30 amp relay. So that will be probably the low voltage disconnect relay, I'm guessing. And then everything else is on the rectifier board. Now, this is the rectifier itself. Its job is to create that 54-volt uh, DC out of AC at up to 5 amps. So, most obvious thing on here, aside from the honking heat sinks, a bunch of them, is these two big smoothing capacitors that are at the output. They are 200-volt, 1500-microfarad capacitors. Uh, Dave Jones will be pleased to see that they are from a reputable manufacturer such as Nippon Chemicon. 
Uh, what, what do we got here? AC input fuse, which is rated at 10 amps. So then underneath this beast of a heat sink here is a big standard bridge, full bridge rectifier. Um, so that would, that's where the AC hits first coming in. It's going to be a switching power supply. Um, with, with all these big transistors, transformer, uh, a couple of three inductors, it's going to be a switching power supply. There's no way that it's a linear power supply. The transformer will be bigger than the whole thing is. Actually, let me pause and just get a, get a look at all these transistors on here and the silicon and whatnot, and we'll go through what we got on here, just in case you're curious. A few moments later. Okay. So what do we have in here? Well, the, uh, we'll start with the big silicon first. These two are both, uh, international rectifier P450 transistors. They are, they're actually N channel hexfet type MOSFETs. They're rated at 14 amps and 500 volts. Yeah, they'll be chopping up the DC coming from here and at the high frequency that you need for, for, uh, switching power supply and running it through the transformer. That's, that's my guess what those ones are doing. Um, over here we have, uh, a UH840, which is an eight amp or actually two times four amp, uh, common anode dual rectifier. It's basically two diodes in the same package. Uh, and the common tab is, is the anode. What have we got over here? No, uh, this one, sorry, is this guy here is dual shot key rectifier, two eight amp common cathode shot key diodes in one package. So I'm not sure. I guess those guys are rectifying after the, uh, rectifying the high frequency down. Um, I couldn't see what this transistor in here is. There is just a bridge of four, uh, regular diodes. There's a bunch more regular diodes up there. Those look like when I can't read the numbers on them because they're all rotated around, but those are going to be like a, a four amp diode probably. Um, and there's one other big power and it's just a one amp NPN power transistor. Okay. And then a bunch of smaller stuff. There's some very high wattage 200 ohm resistors down here. This guy down here actually got pretty hot when I had it on earlier. Uh, another resistor and this oddball resistor, uh, a five ohm, I don't even know what the hell wattage that is, probably 20 watts, but both leads are coming out the same end. That is not a resistor that you see every day. And then some, some larger capacitors, uh, 103, that guy, what's behind him, another 103, those will be knocking high frequencies off. There's a lot of smoothing goes on in any of these, uh, telecom power supplies is they want to create an absolutely dead flat circuit with no noise. that will mess up the next, the, whatever it's powering. Um, which is why there's these big honking filtering capacitors. There's a series inductor. There's these higher frequency capacitors. And that one has gotten completely toasty off of this, uh, actually, so is this one here behind it off this resistor R39. And I can't read what he is because the numbers are baked off it. Wow. Oh, and there's another fuse in here. There's a quarter amp fuse. Another one of those little GMT fuses in there. That's interesting. I guess that's on the control circuitry in here. Speaking of control circuitry, um, we have an LM2903 dual comparator. Uh, not that one. Uh, that one there. We have, this guy is actually the brains of the operation. It's a UC2846 PWM controller. Um, and, oh yeah, uh, something I've noticed, I've been noticing on the, on the chips is the date codes. This one's from 9701. Uh, one of these transistors over here is from 1996. 
and most of the data sheets are in the early to mid 90s, well, in the mid 90s uh, technology. So that leads me to believe that that's, you know, 97, 98 is the build date of this thing, which makes sense because 1999, they stopped, this company stopped being Realtek and started being Marconi. So that pegs it actually pretty close between 97 and 99. That's a, that's a neat piece of industrial kit actually. It's very solid and there's no reason that this thing wouldn't be in service today except for, like I said, the, the service that it was powering was uh, cancelled and the owner of this thing just abandoned it in place. Actually, I know that this thing could still be working because there I've seen some still alive in telephone closets that I've been in. And that's, uh, I don't know, that's, that's all I've got to say about this thing. It's, it's kind of neat to look inside and just see how bulletproof this thing was built. I mean, even with these two resistors getting, getting hot and roasting these capacitors, it hasn't given up the ghost. The capa none of the uh, electrolytic capacitors have a bulge in them or anything like that. This thing was built to last. This thing is industrial equipment. Um, but now, I have a 48 volt power supply. Should I get any other telecom equipment to come my way that I w might want to power up in here? Like, say, a DC powered router. Hmm or DC powered ethernet switch or something like that. That might be fun. The only thing that I'm missing to turn this thing into something really high reliability is of course the battery pack. And a battery pack of that age, I'll be getting on what, 20-ish, uh, pretty close to 20 years old, it would likely be on its last legs at this point anyway. But if I come across one um, that's sitting in the same scrap pile like this one was, I'll try and grab it. Who knows, I could just maybe put new cells in it. Hmm. At the very least, it'd be interesting to look at. Hope you found that interesting. Um, if you are an old telecom dude and you worked with this stuff, uh, I'd like to hear from you down below. That'd be, that'd be cool. Um, Anyone else that has any comments or questions, please leave them down in the comments. Thanks for watching. I will talk to you later. Sadly, it looks like I won't be getting a new Calgary Olympics mug anytime soon.